so uh, yeah, thanks for the organizer giving this opportunity to um, share our findings in this uh, trial blazer OS study, a study for the amyloid targeting therapy. And uh, this talk is uh, going to be focused on the AD biomarkers. Um, go on. So this is my disclosure. Um, I'm actually an employee and a minor stockholder for the Eli Lilly and the company. Uh, I know my uh, in, in my intro, uh, bio is that Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals. Yes, uh, Avid is part of Lilly, so I'm actually the, the employee of uh, Eli Lilly as well. <clears throat> so in this study, we use the Amovid for um, amyloid uh, plaque measurements and the Talvid for the neurofibrillary uh, tangle measurements in an investigational purpose. And uh, the, the, um, the, these tracers are not approved for the use as I'm going to discuss, uh, just a disclosure for it. Uh, I believe everybody should be more than familiar with this, um, this figure. Um, it's a hypothetic model for the biomarker change in the AD, the AD uh, domain proposed by the Clifford Jack. So as you can see in this figure, Accumulation of amyloid beta plaques is an early and essential event in the onset of Alzheimer's disease, leading to other neuropathological uh, neurodegeneration process such as the tau deposition and ultimately progress, co progress to the cognitive and functional impairment. We at Avid have developed the um, two tracers to detect the amyloid plaques and the tau and the tau tangles. Uh, which are the basis um, for the designing of the um, Trailblazer OS study. Uh, a quick uh, background introduction about the nanomap, the, the, the antibody of the tau and the therapy that we studied in the Trailblazer OS study. Uh, the nanomap is the antibody targeted specifically to the N-terminal pyroglutamate antibody beta epitope which we believe is created after the plaque deposition within the plaque itself and is not represented in the other biofluids. This leading to a highly specific amyloid um, tar plaque targeting. And on the red panel, the data we have previously presented in the phase one study showing that uh, the nanomap significantly reduced the amyloid plaques in patients receiving either a single dose or uh, one dose uh, every four weeks for seven, two weeks. And uh, um, that's, this is a study uh, graph of the study design and the dose, uh, dose regimen for trialblazer OS. Um, I want to bring your attention to the, the section under you know, the, the lower part of the figure because this talk is mainly focused on the biomarkers. We do collect a lot of biomarker data in the study. We have amyloid PET scans every 24 weeks or roughly six months apart. And we have tau pad scans um, uh, collected at the beginning and end of the study, as well as a lot of plasma sample collections every, um, every 12 weeks apart, roughly three months apart. So here's the top line result from the study. Uh, first of all, as the amyloid, anti-amyloid antibody, the nanomap significantly reduced the brain amyloid level as shown on the top right uh, figure. Th this data is analyzed using a mixed model with the repeated measurement or we usually called MMRM. Uh, at the week 76, the treated group showed the least square mean change of 85 centiloid, a, a unit um, reflecting the uh, brain, uh, brain amyloid level as detected by the amyloid. Um, we usually consider less than 25 centiloid as the uh, amyloid negative, or in other words, uh, amyloid free. Uh, so by the week of 76, about 60% of the treated subjects become completely remo removal or uh, turn into the amyloid negative. So this drug removed the amyloid very well. And MMRM analysis on the right side, it's a, it's a MMR analysis with the primary clinical endpoint that the address <clears throat> we're using for this study. It's a composite score combining both the cognitive and the functional assessments. The, the, the data also show that uh, there is a slow decline in progression compared with the, um, from the treated group compared with the um, placebo arm. 
and the LS mean least the square mean differences met the statistic significance uh, at the 0.05 level at week 76. Uh, as a downside, uh, downstream bar marker tau measurement, the, uh, the tau measurement is reflected on the tau pad scans. Um, but also showed interestingly showed the slowing decline. They are still progressing, but uh, compared with the placebo group, the treated group showed a slower decline and slower pro progress in a sense um, uh, throughout the brain regions were measured. Here we're showing the data from the, the regional SUVR, regional measurement from lateral temporal, occipital, and the frontal. Um, we also have a measurement from a global assessment. Data is not shown here, but this hold the same pattern. So uh, we, we actually dive a little bit more on amyloid reduction. What we found is that the nanomap result in the early amyloid uh, reduction. Um, the, the 24 weeks, the first uh, planned post-treatment assessments, we are already seeing quite some reduction from the patient receiving the nanomap. And um, the, the, the amyloid reduction showed the relationship with the baseline value. So the higher the baseline value, the more reduction is showed up. Um, so we also the, try to evaluate the probability of getting, um, getting complete amyloid removal status um, uh, and, and the look at the relationship with the baseline value as reflected on the lower left corner. That's a logistic regression to evaluate the probability of hitting the complete amyloid the removal status at week 24, we're seeing uh, the larger probability um, getting the complete amyloid removal with the lower baseline value um, is actually expected because the lower you have with the strong removal, it's easier to hit the amyloid free level. And this relationship holds true uh, not only for the 24 weeks, but also for the 56 as reflected in the red curve and the 76 weeks as reflected in the green curve. So, um, it, obviously, we, we need to look at how this uh, <clears throat> early uh, removal impact the tau accumulation. As shown in this figure, we uh, look at the across the whole brain regions uh, in the, and arrange that in a, in a pathological sequence as determined by the event-based model, um, and then separate <clears throat> and, and estimate the mean change from baseline. Um, by the placebo and the treatment arm is breaking to is broken into the partial amyloid re removal or complete am amyloid removal as I, um, as defined by the less than 20, 25 or not, as I just mentioned. And the finding is that um, first of all, throughout the whole brain regions, the treated group um, had a, a smaller increase in the tau signal, as you can see here. And uh, interesting delay, the complete amyloid removal showed the least amount of the tau increase at the 76 weeks as compared to the other group. And, uh, and this effect seems to be more, more, um, more uh, uh, significant at the brain regions uh, uh, being affected by the, uh, by the AD pathology, the last, for example, the uh, uh, frontal region. So and, and lately, lately, there are a lot of progress in the uh, plasma biomarker space. And the, the one, one, one thing is that we do, as I mentioned, we do collect a lot of plasma, um, uh, plasma data. So allow us the opportunity to look into, the, the look into those biomarkers, the, which could provide the independent proof for the dynamic treatment effect pathologically. Uh, I, I want to particularly focus on the PTAL217, uh, AD specific and the sensitive biomarker, as well as the glare fabulary acid protein or GFAP. It's a non specific biomarker that may indicate neurodegeneration, inflammation, and injuries, all those things are going on. Um, the quick background about the PTAL217 uh, is that uh, the researcher has shown, researchers have shown that uh, this. Uh, marker is highly associated with the AD. And, and, and the, uh, as shown on the left, uh, left uh, figure, figure on the left side, it's, it appears to go up in the amyloid positive and the tau pet negative patients, perhaps before the um, tau aggregates are detectable on the tau pet. 
And in the middle figure, it's uh, a quantitative pass analysis also suggests that uh, P tau 217 is measured, is measuring the early tau pathology and it may be more sensitive to the onset of the Alzheimer disease pathology. And uh, lastly, the um, study on the right side reported the P tau 217 is highly accurately to detect the tau pad signal. Um, with the, uh, this is the RC analysis, receiver operating curve analysis, and the area under the curve reported is 0.93. It's uh, uh, very good, uh, had a very good diagnostic performance. So back to our study, uh, when we look at the P tau 217 using the MMRM model on the left side of the figure, well, we are seeing after the treatment, the patient actually show a reduction in the P tau 217 as well. And uh, the signal start to show the significance <clears throat> after 12 weeks after the treatment. And uh, at, the month, at the week 76, uh, the P tau 217 from treated group is actually decreased about 23% as a comparison in the placebo group. Then it's actually increased the 60%. We believe this is reflecting the progress of the, the disease from the treatment group. And, and, uh, and also there's the um, interesting delay, the GFAP, this non-specific biomarker as the uh, general neurodegeneration um, status in the, in the brain also showed the a, a reduction at about 12% at the week 76. And uh, as a comparison, the placebo group increased 15% uh, from baseline at the same amount, uh, during the same amount of the follow-up time. So now let's look at the association of the P tau 27 decrease versus the amyloid plaque clearance. Um, we actually observed the association between the two, the statistically significant association between the two. It's positively correlated at the both 24 weeks and uh, 76 weeks. The 52 weeks data, I, I didn't put the data here, but it's hold the same pattern. And uh, once again, we divide the treatment group as the um, uh, complete the removal versus partial removal and compared to the placebo, looking at both the P tau 217 and the GFAP. Um, it's a, it's a, we don't see a clear differences between the early amyloid removal. It seems like as long as amyloid is removed, the, the signal um, kept pretty similar between, across the P tau 217 and the GFAP. And also <clears throat> take a look at that. We also took a look at the, um, um, the, the, the decrease of the P tau 27 and its association with the tau, um, tau signal, the, the measurement of the neurofibrillary tangle at 76 weeks. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's also uh, like uh, um, pretty clearly uh, the statistic significant, significant uh, association was detected. And the data I'll show here is from parietal lobe and the frontal lobe. The, um, the, the other data hold the same pattern as well. So now we have already seen <clears throat> the treatment effect on the, um, on the biomarker the, the from independent uh, two class, one from the PAT and the one from the uh, plasma, as well as observe the clinical benefit uh, reflected on the IDRA score. Uh, now, the natural question is that how does the biomarker change correlates with the, um, the clinical benefit? We have done quite a, some uh, not different kind of analysis. One particular interesting analysis I want to bring here is the uh, one of the PKPD model uh, published by Conrad and, uh, and others in 2014. So we call it a Conrad model to evaluate the relationship between the biomarker change and the slowing in the clinical uh, clinical decline. I, I, I just uh, list a little bit of detail about this model and uh, for the sake of time, I, I don't think I can uh, go over too much of the detail, but in general, the, the, this model links the, um, links the, <clears throat> links the uh, amyloid reduction to the clinical benefit through this uh, PEFF parameter, which is estimated uh, using this model. And here's the result of this modeling. 
um, on the left side is address address correlation um, with the amyloid removal and from the entire population. And we do see a statistic significant association between the amyloid reduction versus address benefit. And this benefit appears to be a little bit larger from if we're looking at the APOE carriers only, but uh, the majority of, since majority of the study are APOE4 carriers, I think it's uh, about 80% 80, 80 are APOE4 carriers. We yet need to um, validate this findings in a larger, larger scale study, which is currently ongoing as well. So another way to look at uh, um, the relationship between amyloid reduction and the clinical benefit is, uh, is to look across the, the overall relationship um, across the studies in the same class. So here we summarize the uh, published data in the anti-amyloid uh, anti -amyloid antibody class, including the Adekanumab, GetNewsMap, Lacanumab, and our of course, our own uh, the NetMap studies. This slide is not intended to compare the treatment effects between the studies because every step in study is uniquely designed. The recruitment criteria, everything are different. So we can't really compare them side by side. The purpose of this figure is to show that uh, <clears throat> the amyloid removal are actually observed to be associated with the with the clinical benefit. Uh, by the way, the circle of each, uh, each dot is actually, the size of the circle is, uh, is the size of the study. The larger the circle, the larger the study size. Uh, <clears throat> so as, uh, as shown in this figure, there is appear to be a clinical um, association between the clinical benefit with the amyloid removal, um, a positive association right here. So in general, we could see the, see it uh, um, the larger amyloid reduction, the the more clinical benefit. So I also want to use the rest of the time to talk a little bit about our ongoing work. Um, we still uh, want to uh, try to understand more about the association between the biomarker and the clinical benefit. One of the analysis we have been doing is the, um, the Bayesian network method, applying the Bayesian network method to to the um, uh, association between uh, between the biomarkers, all kinds of biomarkers we have versus clinical benefit. I apologize for the messiness about the uh, figure. It's uh, purely for the illustration purpose. Um, so just as the illustration, the, the, it, we, we can apply the knowledge or from, from the prior experience or ex expert knowledge, hypothetical relationship to the data but sometimes the, 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 the um, relationship directly applied to the data may not stand out as, uh, as clear as we want to see, or sometimes it's even confusing. So we apply the Bayesian method as a um, <clears throat> updated the model with the real data information. And uh, through this process, the signal could be, uh, the real signal could be enlarged um, by, based on the reflect, you know, the, the information coming back from the data and the former, the more informative uh, um, picture for us to understand. We are uh, actually, this is a pilot analysis uh, using a static Bayesian network because only look at, this method, the analysis only look at the cross-sectional data. Eventually we're going to um, <clears throat> apply this to a, a change from baseline type of the data, apply a, a dynamic Bayesian network model to the data. Hopefully we can get something out uh, rel relatively quick. So another interesting um, method that we're applying to the data uh, and still on, also ongoing is the subtype and the staging inferences. Um, it's a, a artificial intelligent type of the model. Uh, we call it the SUSDAM model. And uh, the model is actually in, um, input the, input the uh, um, example here is like input the tau pad scan, uh, the different regions feeding to this model. And uh, the model is uh, going to clustering the patients and ordering the stage from <clears throat> from from the uh, from from the feed the data and come up with a certain subtype. Um, so in, in the, as an illustration here, we apply this model to the PET scan data and coming come out with the field subtype. 
uh, as shown here, we're still trying to understand what does those subtype mean? Do they have the unique the unique progression pattern, and uh, and how also how does this pattern correlates with the clinical and uh, other biomarkers? And uh, if there's any uh, pattern specifically more responding to the treatment, etc. A lot of questions to ask. So in general, <clears throat> uh, in this uh, registration quality phase two study. Um, the, the, including the patients with early symptomatic AD. Uh, we treat them with the map, and uh, we are seeing effective amyloid plaque removal. And also we have seen the, down, uh, the impact to the downstream biomarkers, including the tau accumulation. And uh, this uh, the, uh, drives a rapid reduction in the plasma P tau 217 as the, detected within 12 weeks. Also, the changes in amyloid plaque level and the PTOP um, 217 is positively correlated with slowing of uh, clinical progression, as shown by the Colorado model. The other, other analysis ongoing is to further evaluate the relationship as changing AD biomarkers and clinical progressions. So that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Pitak, I have a question. Is there any graph that look, that shows a correlation between two measures without the modeling, an, ob an objective measure of amyloid and an objective measure of clinical improvement? I say this because oh, yeah. that would be the clear. I, and I understand what you're saying. It, oh, yeah. Probably, but something that, because the data that I showed was something that the Lilly group published in the New England Journal of Medicine, perhaps using slightly different data, but there was really no correlation there. And yeah, you know, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. A great question. Um, yes, uh, we, we actually did evaluate in that way. It's hard to detect, uh, de detect uh, you know, this kind of the co uh, correlation. Uh, just apply uh, scatter plot. Hopefully, we, we, we initially we hope that we can see something like this, but uh, Indeed, the data, do, as you just mentioned, did not show clear correlation right there. We we're actually wondering if this is the correct method to, to show this, uh, to capture this signal, because the um, amyloid, um, the, 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 we, the, the study is only lasted for, 16, uh, for 18 months, 76 weeks. Uh, the AD process itself is like a 10 plus years process. The signal accumulated in within 18 months may not be large enough to detect reflecting out in in this kind of an analysis. Yeah, yeah, great question. It's uh, this is why uh, we we turn into the Conrad model, all those more sophisticated sophisticated models, trying to see if the if there's a way to enlarge the ex uh, and extract the signal out from from um, from this data. Thank you. Anyone? No? If not, thank you very much. I really appreciate the talk. Thanks. All right. Thank you. So let me just stop this.